Is everybody awake and alive this morning? Woo! Yeah. All right, who was out late last night? I was. Who feels 135 years old right now? I do. <laughs> yeah, good, we're all in the same place. I just wanna thank everyone who came. It's awesome to see you. And uh, we have uh, put together a panel of different people who have each worked on cross-platform games in their own and unique way. And when we were putting together the panel, one of the things that we were thinking about is perspective. Everyone's got a different perspective on what cross-platform games are. Each one of us has done it a little bit differently. I look at cross-platform games from one way, you guys look at it from a completely different way. Uh, what I've done at Arcadium is take games uh, that existed as web versions and brought them to all different platforms. Um, sometimes you're redeveloping in the time to bring these to different platforms, and sometimes you're starting from a single code, code base. So what we want to talk about is how other people are doing it and what advantages they found in bringing games to other platforms and just have a more kind of fireside chat, like a little family type chat. Can we sit in a circle and hold hands? <laughs> Sing a little kumbaya, kind of go for it from there. So um, I will let everybody introduce themselves first. Do you want to begin, Matthew? Yeah, um, my name is Matthew and I'm the co-founder and CEO of the company Fresh Planet. You, you may know us from a, a game called Song Pop, which was and still is very, very successful. Uh, and uh, we are a, a base in New York City. Uh, we are a small company, about 25 people. Go New York. Rah, rah. Um, I'm Lisa Paulson. I do business development for the games group at a and &E Television Networks. We dropped the television, but I put that in there to help everybody today. Um, we um, have History, Lifetime, and A&E channels along with Bio and have a lot of linear content that sometimes is appropriate for interactive. So that's what we focus on. Uh, hello, my name is Rob Sandberg. I'm with Reliance Games. We are a, uh, a company, a subsidiary of uh, uh, Reliance Industries out of India. We have uh, development studios in uh, Mumbai and Pune. I'm based in the uh, Toronto office. Uh, we, our most recent release was uh, Pacific Rim. We typically deal with uh, li licensed products. I'm Kara Kalavart. I work at uh, Unity Technologies, one of the awesome softwares to easily port the games to other uh, platforms, but I'm going to talk more about that. Uh, I'm a product evangelist, so I go around the world and I give talks and presentations how easy Unity is. Uh, and I'm based in Canada, in an igloo. <laughs> Great. So I promised uh, Lisa Paulson, because she was the most tired this morning, that I actually pick on her the most. So uh, I live up to that promise right now. Uh, excellent. So Lisa, you guys do a lot. You have TV programs. TV programs are awesome, and you get to turn a lot of those television programming into games. Uh, Cross-platform-wise, what are you doing? What are you supporting right now? And like, what, what programs have you made cross-platform games for? So we, um, we support digital platforms, so digital download platforms. So it can be a web-based game. It can be a Facebook Canvas game. It can be iOS, Android. Um, moving to the Amazon Kindle Android, um, doing um, where our developers use Unity, pushing them even further and doing some box products for PC and Mac. Um, so we kind of go wherever makes the most sense for the product and for our fan base. So as Neil pointed out, we make games based on our linear content. Not all our linear con content is available to us because it's tied up in rights issues, but where it is available and where it makes sense to make a game, say Pawn Stars or Duck Dynasty or um, Swamp People, um, all very interesting linear content. Um, and we, we've brought them to Interactive. And so we've done Facebook games. Um, we started off there a couple years ago doing Pawn Stars for Facebook. Um, and that platform was chosen at the time because that's what everybody else was doing. So um, we had to, had to have a pre presence there. Um, I'm from the games business, but the TV company is, is definitely sort of tuned into what the market is doing or what the, what the market is being the loudest about. So um, as the market switched to mobile, everybody's like, well, why aren't we on mobile? Um, so we started doing some mobile products, but we've kind of equalized at this point into making products um, for platforms where it makes sense. So instead of saying, we have to have a Facebook game, or we have to have an iOS game, um, what makes the, makes the most sense? So if you're driving a swamp boat around um, the swamp trying to shoot alligators, 
Um, do you need a mouse for that? Do you need, um, would it be easier to do it on a touch screen? Make those sort of decisions based on the content um, as opposed to just following a platform. So do you do the development in-house? No. All source? Yes. So what do you do? There's only four of us in the games group at a and &E, um, and none of us code. So um, you know, we do all outsourcing. Um, we've done some on a work for hire basis, and sometimes we do it as a co-pub. Um, where people are making the investment on the development and we're providing the IP and the marketing and the publishing um, and like a million different permutations between that, those two models. But um, which, ones, which has been most successful for you for platforms? So I know you decide based on what makes sense, but like overall. Do you on see platforms? Most, um, yeah. And I, I, I don't know whether it's because of the platform or because of the IP. Oh. So my gut would tell me that um, the reason why Pawn Stars has been our biggest hit to date and has lasted the longest is because of the IP, not necessarily because it's only on Facebook at this point, um, coming to mobile in a couple weeks. Um, but it, that's why, <coughs> because of the IP, not because necessarily it was Facebook. Cool. Matthew, how's it going? Uh, pretty good. So you have taken a little bit of a, a different <coughs> approach to cross-platform games when you did Song Pop. And I know, um, I think a lot of people don't know about this technique, and I thought it'd be interesting to tell a little bit about how did you develop uh, Song Pop, or what was the kind of mentality when you went into it? We had a lo lot of constraints at the time. Uh, uh, first was a financial constraint. We, we were just, we're still a startup company, and, and we had very limited cash in the bank. Actually, we were close to uh, closing the company. Uh, so we, we decided to go for the, the uh, you know the easiest route, and we decided to use Adobe Air, which and Songpop was developed with a team of you know six people, and on iOS, Android, and on Facebook Canvas in just a matter of weeks. Uh, and this technology, why not perfect, really enable us to um, uh, launch on multiple platforms at the same time. Uh, and it's it's part of the reason for the success of Songpop. We've had more than 80 million players since we launched 15 months ago. Um, and um, uh, if you have, especially if you have a multiplayer game, whether it's real time or asynchronous, having multiple platform is really key because you want to reach critical mass. If, if you play with friends or strangers, you need to be on, on as many platforms as possible. So let's say if we had launched Songpop only on iOS, only friends with an iOS device could play together, which is very limiting. Uh, so that, that's what we chose at the time. That's really cool. Carl, just from your side, do you um, see a lot of developers are coming to you um, that have done something like Flash Flex before and then you're trying to go into Unity? What is the advantage of kind of the approach that you're going to offer from that perspective? Well, <clears throat> uh, it's really easy from Unity. I, our slogan is uh, create one time and deploy it anywhere. That's one of the strengths that we offer for everybody that you make it one time and you can deploy to it almost any platform that's on the market. That's our strength, of course, but let's say hey, we have to look at it from a very realistic viewpoint and not see it from like, yeah, I click a button, it's all done, your work. Yeah. There's, there's a bit challenges there. Uh, I think one of the most important thing I would say, hire game designers who have worked on different platforms uh, so that they're aware of that. So the design starts from the beginning with creating a multi-platform game and not from later on we made a game and we're going to port it if you start to design it right away then later on your problems will be a lot less i think that's what we uh, you always have to focus on from the beginning so, so do you think developers go in a little bit blind sometimes and think that unity is going to be the one end all be all answer they're like it's all answered here we're done i can just use unity <laughs> and i'll be all set i'll go everywhere well i can also sh just switch it, the question around and everything it could be like from uh, some when you talk to indie guys yeah. They said, okay, we're going to use Unity for multi-platform. They make a game, but then they are afraid to start to port it to other platforms because they hear the horror stories, how difficult it is, how much work it involved in this. Okay. Uh, yes, there's work involved. We cannot deny that. But I think I said from the beginning, if you start from the beginning to understand what multi-platform is, you have a whole different roadmap and, and the workflow with Unity. Uh, it takes a bit of time to adjust what is actually multi-platform development. Okay. What I understand there's a big difference if a large company does a port versus an indie company who does a port. An indie company doesn't have yeah. so much resources. They might have the financial money to do multi-platform in one shot. Say like, we're gonna make uh, a PC version and an iOS version in one shot. 
But I think the big difference between there and the problems that are going to come there is that the indie guys don't have always the resources for support later on and to negotiate the contracts to keep on the ongoing process. And that is where I think the large companies have a lot to offer to work together with indie studios to work together for a multi-platform. Rob, you've been around for a while doing this, right? What did you say before, 14 years? 18. 18, 18 years, <coughs> sorry, to cut it short. Um, what do you think? You've seen this world change a lot, and you started on, more on the console side, and now you're in this mobile slash social world. What's changed? What do you see is kind of the same, a little bit of the same, but just a little different spin on it? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the main difference that I've seen in multi-platform on the consoles is the uh, first-party hardware, you know, the first-party requirements aren't as stringent, which is kind of nice. Cool. We don't have to worry about the TRCs, TCRs as much as because, you know, there's definitely a hard cost associated with a multi-platform title when you have to accommodate those. Sometimes, even though it's one platform or one title, it's almost like you're working on three different games at the same time. Uh, but I think the thing that you know that, that, that we've seen with uh, with the multi-platform and the challenges that we've seen is a lot. What you were talking about is that uh, if development, if you if you're not thinking about multi-platform from the beginning, at the very end of the project, there's all kinds of re requirements that aren't uncovered that can slow you down, uh, especially around things around performance. Um, you know, I, the iPhone 4 is a reality. We have to support it. We need to be able to you know. So the developers, as long as you know what your system minimum specs are and know what devices you're targeting and know what uh, the memory is on those devices and you make that you know the the choice and also yep. your lead programmer and your lead designers make sure they're working on all of those min spec devices yep. uh, all along and if you do those things up front and you and, and you and you plan to be a multi-platform title from the beginning uh, you're going to make things a lot to your point you're going to make things a lot easier at the end so Matthew, if you were going to turn back the clock and start the development on something like Song Pop again, would you take the same route? I think we would. Uh, yep. uh, and, and, and I talked about financial constraint, but it, it's not the only reason why we chose this. Uh, we wanted to keep the team very, very small. Um, and it's, it's not just for, again, just for you know, making more profit. It's also because in, in social gaming, you need to have a rapid pace of development. You need to be nimble and agile. And, um, uh, the bigger the team, the slower you go, um, and and uh, you know uh, that's why we keep team very very small. And having a multi-platform, you know, tools like Adobe Air or could be Unity is is very helpful because with a very small team, you can launch uh, uh, updates or new release very very quickly. In the case of SongPop, uh, I would say the typical release cycle is like one version, one build every two weeks, uh, sometimes uh, one every week. Um, and imagine if you had to have, I mean, some big companies have a team working on iOS, another one working on Android, and another one working on, on, on a web version, for example. And, and in this scenario, it, it becomes very, very difficult to keep everyone in sync and to uh, have very rapid uh, cycle of release, like once every, once a week or, or so. Uh, so I think we would, we would do the same. I think that the question now, and, and the technology that everyone is looking for is, is there um, um, a, a platform that can really help developer build for the web, for iOS, for Android, and, and, and um, it's still uh, a very difficult question to answer. Uh, uh, many people have bet on HTML5, and I don't know if we want to discuss about this later on. <laughs> um, um, sorry for you guys, it's, it's, it's not going to happen anytime soon, I think. Uh, but maybe in 2015, 2016, who knows? Uh, and in the meantime, uh, I don't think there is like the perfect solution. Yeah, it's funny. It's, uh, one of the things that we've done, based on a recommendation that you had given us uh, a while back, is done some flash flex for multi-platform at my business and also taking a Unity route as well to try to see you know, what we're able to do as we were flash shop and we had a lot of experience in that realm that helped us kind of do one, one approach and then trying the Unity approach as well, and we found both to be really interesting and we'd be able to move pretty quickly. Um, what platform do you see the most traction when you're acquiring users? We have all millions of people walking around in the audience here that are about user acquisition, so like, um, do you acquire more through your mobile or your social? Which it's, I mean, in our case, it's, it's, it's one big platform, so even when you play on iOS and Android, we use the Facebook recruiting platform, a Facebook Open Graph, uh, and it's very, very efficient. So even when you play on your iPhone, we will publish on your wall, and it's been very good for us. 
um, I'd say that the iOS is still for us the, the, leading, the leading platforms in terms of uh, user base monetization. Uh, Android is catching up with the user base, not so much on, on monetization yet, but uh, we think it will come soon. Um, and Facebook is an incredible platform to recruit players and engage players, whether it's on Facebook Canvas or through uh, mobile devices. And Lisa, you guys do a lot of your acquisition through, through your television network. And uh, where do you find that most um, come to the, the applications? Is it mobile or social? Um, I guess it depends on the IP again, too. Though. Yeah, it does depend on the IP. Um, yeah. I think that um, our, fan, our, our user base is our fan base, and our fan base is um, very uh, middle America and um, southeast, um, southern states. And so I think that their technology trending is a little slower than sort of us coasters. Um, so we, we are seeing a lot of social interaction with our fan base, and we spend a lot of money doing social um, pu pushes, Twitter, Facebook, whatever, for, um, for our def different properties. So we, we won't lead so much all the time on Facebook, but it is, it's a very viable platform for us and our user base, um, and it allows us to talk directly to them, you know, for moving them from the fan page on Duck to the game page on Duck, and then pushing them eventually down into the mobile um, through the Connect and, and using the Facebook platform on the mobile side as well. Um, so it does depend. I mean, last year we did a, an iOS launch of Swamp, and we ran an ad on TV and had three million downloads in about six weeks. So, um, so it works, um, but they don't. Um, but it, uh, yeah, it, I think social still is going to be where we um, will lead off. You see a vast difference in the monetization between the two, or is it fairly uh, similar habits? It's hard. It, it's hard because we don't really kind of have an apples apples comparison yep. yet. Um, so, but um, we still are seeing um, we're seeing a lot of revenue on iOS. We see a lot of install on Android and and kind of trailing revenue there. <laughs> um, so long tail. Long tail. No, uh, no, no tail. <laughs> Not much tail. Um, so you know. So we we are seeing a lot of revenue in, in iOS, um, and we're but we're still seeing a lot of revenue on Facebook Canvas too. So we'll we'll keep it there. And Rob, you're, you're approaching it a little bit different too. You're making games for India too, right? And that's your primary focus. How is it different than the US in your experience of the things you've seen? Well, I, actually, we, we're really focused on North America. North America. Yeah, yeah. The, 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 the Indian business is very important to us, yep. but it's, um, it's a growth opportunity. Uh, you know, we, uh, you know, we're, you know, we, we are primarily focused. On, we lead off on iOS, but uh, we also f uh, have had great successes on, on Android, um, uh, not just in Google Play, but on the, you know, the on, on Amazon as well. So, so uh, we, you know, we right now, you know, our main business is North America. We work with big North American brands, so that's that's really our focus. Uh, but uh, the, uh, but the, you know, the. the India is looming, and uh, <laughs> be, because of the fact that my, my company is a, um, we're kind of, to, your, to use your analogy, we're kind of the GE of India. Uh, we own um, telephone companies and mobile carriers and such, and because of that, uh, we have a, we, we, our, our Zapac um, portal is, a, um, is a, uh, one of the largest portals for matchmaking and discovery, and uh, we, because of that, we have carrier billing. And it's, in India, it's going to be all about the carrier billing because people don't have credit cards. People don't consume content on their mobile devices with a credit card. They do it, charge it to their, 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 their phone. So, uh, and which makes uh, the, uh, you know, the Android platform, you know, because of their, they have these $100 phones yep. that are, you know, like growing like 4,000% a month or something like that, some crazy numbers. So, um, you know, we, we really see that as a growth market for us. Great. And Carl? Most developers, they're coming to you. They're most interested in mobile. They're most interested in social. Which one are they trying to like tackle first? Well, when we look at our numbers, I think iOS and Android are very important to us. It's where all the indies uh, go to. Uh, but I think that uh, with Unity, we really look out always and try to help out. The social aspect is very important. Uh, we just announced our partnership actually with Facebook, so it makes it easy for people to create on all the platforms why the social integration. Uh, but even uh, in Asia, we just announced that uh, our, our plugin from the web player is fully installed on the 360 browser. So I think we always, at Unity, we have to look at 
the social aspect and the platform platform because if you build social aspects your platform will be a lot more viable so with unity it's it's always difficult because we have to look at the platform that will be successful but we have to be ahead of the game to create it and to support it uh, so that's why we announced already our support for Tizen coming up or support hey, we have no just released also the blackberry we also released the um, the windows 8 uh, so uh, we always listen to our community and try to support as much as possible we can uh, and as long as the, the platform is viable and there's a lot of little platforms that come out that we don't support and we, and we know that but it's not viable for the indie community and with unity uh, we try to support the indies and the large companies for every platform we can uh, and I think we have seen some great success stories on iOS and Android with Unity. If you look at Ski Safari, the game had 25 million downloads alone in, in Asia, in China. Um, but now we're also really focusing on more the social aspect and other new upcoming platforms. But come to our uh, Unite Vancouver to learn more about that. <laughs> <laughs> um. Matthew, one question is like you've been making games for some time and you have a lot of experience with team sizes and you know structures of like you know how many developers, artists and you know producer, everybody you would staff to a game. As you thought more in this like multi-platform cross-platform world, how has that changed? Has it gotten bigger? It, you know, do you need more people? Are you still like as you mentioned before, you know, keeping a fairly small team to work on it to keep it more focused? Yeah, we we, we want to keep a very small team to keep the focus yeah. uh, and um, uh, yeah, very often as you want to scale, your team goes bigger, and, and again, uh, as the team goes bigger, everything goes slower, uh, <laughs> uh, and, and it happens all the time, so we're trying to keep a very, very small team, uh, independent team, um, and they work on different games and different uh, projects, uh, and I think it, it, it also depends on the type of game you want to do. Uh, some games require more resources, whether it's artists or developers. In our case, we're lucky enough to make more simple games which require uh, less people, so it's easier for us to innovate and launch new features or correct bugs. Lisa, about, how about your team sizes when you're using an outsourced developer? I mean, do you limit the amount of people that can be on a project, or do you, how do you guys go about it from your side? Um, we, we actually try and stay out of the business That's of good. the developers. Um, you know, I, I, We've all, they always want to give us kind of the staff count and how many hours they're working on this or that. And truthfully, I don't kind of want to know that. Um, I want to know what they're going to deliver and when they're going to deliver it and how that looks. Um, and I agree with you. I've been in this business for a long time. I think the larger the team, the worse things get. You can't throw, you can't throw, keep throwing resources and money at something to make it faster. It just makes it messy. Um, but for us at Any, we don't we don't mess with our developer teams, and we don't actually determine how they're going to work. So if they want to use Air, or if they want to use Unity, or if they want to do native, that's their business as well. Um, I'm I'm a supporter of doing kind of the Air slash Unity because then it gives us um, the opportunity to spread it. If the product is successful, we can keep kind of moving it to other platforms, but, um, but I won't dictate that either. And Rob, how, how's it different? You're using outsourced developers for a lot of your work as well. Well, uh, so we're, we're split. So we have an internal studio in Pune, uh, which has a very co core competency in uh, uh, developing on Unity, as well as, our, as we had all, all of our back-end operations are there. Uh, and then we also work with third-party partners um, our third party partners, we typically encourage Unity um, because of the fact that when you speak about, well, no, so, I mean, I, I, you know, he, I'm not, I'm not, get, yeah, yeah, I'm not getting a payoff here or anything. No, the reality is, is that, is that, um, you know, we deal a lot with smaller teams and, and smaller companies. And, you know, when we, we are a worldwide company and like, you know, when you, one of the biggest problems we have is fragmentation and support for all of these different, so you talk about uh, Samsung S3. Well, I don't know if you know this, but in four different countries, there's four different chipsets, and you have four different sets of bugs and compatibility issues. So by working with developers who use Unity, what that allows us to do is when they're working on their game and then we start getting into uh, alpha and beta and we engage our quality assurance department, a lot of times 
you know, we've seen these things and we know what's going on because of the number of uh, games that we have in the pipeline. So um, we work very early on with our developers and with in terms of Unity best practices and things that we've learned so that there's, you know, hey, here's some things that we've stumbled on in the past and here's some, some best practices that you should follow. And then when we get near the end, there's that time where not all developers are going to have uh, somebody that really works down into the heavy metal of Unity. So we have programmers that do, our, our senior programmers that do. So a lot of times we'll end up you know, taking a look at the source code and helping them fix those problems that happen at the very end that helps us get the product across the, uh, across the finish line. Well, it's very hands-on. Very hands-on. Yeah, you, does it try to be a little crazy? You're a very wise man. <laughs> <laughs> so Carl, I'm always curious. Um, we're fairly small development shops. Small developers have a certain approach to kind of going about it. And there's these large, you know, EA-sized uh, developers mm -hmm. out there. You and you go to visit both of those companies. Like you came to mine, you sat down with us, you kind of huddle us up, you teach us some of the best practices. Do you have to do that with these large companies too? Or is there a different approach or big and small companies going about it the same way? What are they doing? Uh, I think that's a very good question. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I worked in both. I worked uh, in, in AAA and I worked in indie, but my passion is indie. And then the landscape totally changed. And in the beginning with Unity, I was really involved with the indie community. And that's where we came from. And then you visit the large studios and it's exactly the same questions you get. And it's like, wow. And I think also the landscape has changed a bit from the large studios where they want to make sure they have flexible, smaller teams working together on a project. Okay. So with Unity, we, over time we have built tools for everybody that larger teams can work together and it's still, we're still working on it. But I think the biggest, the biggest difference is, is the support they have, the money they have, large companies for the support of the game and right away go multi-platform. I think that's the largest thing. But from a technical viewpoint and design viewpoint, I see a lot, very lot of similarities the same. Uh, and it's uh, the only thing I would say maybe if I was to visit an industry, studio, sometimes they less sort of experienced uh, in game development. So sometimes they get more optimization questions. And when you go to large studios, sometimes they come more from the console market and then in another way, they have to also optimize for lower end devices. <laughs> so they see it from a different angle sometimes, but I get a lot of the same questions. So I got one for you. Okay. What's your favorite cross-platform game that's not developed in Unity? Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Is that wrong? <laughs> I've never heard of that game not made in Unity. <laughs> <laughs> oh, come on. I play from no... I, I mainly play Unity games, but I, I look from, always from games, but I, I could not even know a non-Unity game. Like my, one of my favorite games, of course, Ski Safari I play all the time. Yeah. But from cross platform, I like to play Shadowgun, because it plays on a lot of different devices. But I'm a guy who lives in a suitcase, so my console is stolen by my wife. Uh, I only play mobile games because I'm on the road, so it's difficult to see really multi-platform games who are not made in Unity. <laughs> so. If you want to play Unity games, I can give you a list. <laughs> so I'm going to open this one up to the, the forum, the last question. It's kind of, what's real and what's fake? I mean, do you, do you have to make the games exactly the same? Can you make the game slightly different for different platforms? I mean, so if you're developing a game, does it have to be the exact same matching experience like a Candy Crush? Or can you have you know, differences in the games? What do you think is the best way to approach cross-platform? Does it have to be the exact same game? Because I mean, there's considerations for games. like. Like you said earlier, like, will this work with a mouse? Will this not work, you know, with your finger? How does it, you know, what do you think? Well, you know, I, I'm only speaking from the mobile perspective. And, you know, there's, you, you really want to take advantage of economies of scale. And, you know, uh, the, the more you fragment, you know, the more it impacts your development costs. So for us, we really try to make it the same experience because it's really hard to tune in experience. Yeah. Uh, the only thing that may vary is maybe some of the economic tuning, but that's all stuff variables on the back end. When it comes to the game experience, we really try to keep as much of a common denominator as possible. And for us, it's the, it's the aspect ratios that we have to deal with. That's really you know, the main difference that we have between the platforms. So you, the game experience is going to be the same. Uh, the pacing is going to be the same, but you may find that the UI placement may, may vary, but it's, it's, we, we keep it all as the same content. Matthew, same for you too? Yes, same thing. Same thing? Yeah. You know, I, I would say like this. Making a game, making a for different devices, that is, is, is the same as making a game for different countries. You want to give the same experience, but you still want to have their experience that they have the feel the same. Like when I look at the game Ski Safari, for instance, it's the same play, it's the same input, but it localized by just changing the artwork 
and, and to China. That works, and I, I feel it's the same. You want to have the same experience, you want to have to feel connected to the game, and you feed a different art maybe or different input to get the connection for the people, the device. And that's, I think, the most important thing. It's, just, it's very similar to that. So. so what's the most maddening part about this whole process? I'd like to just add one thing to that. No. So I mean, <laughs> okay. I'll beat you later. Um, the, uh, <laughs> across a mobile device, um, you know, cross-platform, so if you're saying an iOS and an, and an Android device are, are a cross-platform sort of strategy, I don't necessarily see it that way. I see that kind of as a platform. Those are, that's your mobile platform. Um, and you can decide not to do Android or iOS, but that's your mobile platform. And I think that experience does need to be the same. I think that with the screen sizes, you can change kind of how the, the, the game is presented maybe, but not really. You kind of want to make sure that the experience feels the same. But if you're moving it from a canvas to a mobile device, you have a completely different input device there. You also may have a hugely um, robust sort of resource management game, game that you're doing a cross-platform with. And you don't necessarily need to have all the bells and whistles um, from the canvas sitting on your mobile. If you really all you want to do is do a check-in and make sure that your stuff is, is working and people are doing what they're supposed to be doing <laughs> in your factory or wherever, um, it, you're not you're not going to have your whole game experience necessarily. So I don't think it has to be the same from those two cross-platform. Yeah, I mean, is there something to be said for using, like, if you have a social game that's doing well and you create a mobile version that's a bit different and it's a little bit of a different play, gameplay experience, and you use it as, like, an add-on, as something to do when you're away from your desktop? I mean, do enough people take part of that? Because that would be interesting, right? You have a game that has a different component when you're away from your computer. Something that feeds your, you know, your need and lust for the game while you're away. I mean, I feel like a lot of people don't do that. I mean, is there a reason? Or? I mean, I think that you know, you've got to figure out how to monetize, right? So yep. I mean, you're not going to do a port just to, to keep them occupied. So you have to make sure that that core game loop still has a, a money tag in it. Yep. Um, so, but I do think that you can create something that allows the person to connect with their larger experience while they're on the road. Um, uh, by, by allowing, I mean, Pawn Stars, you know, we're going to put most of the game into the mobile, but, you know, if, if what you really, all you want to do is make sure that your stuff is sold while you're on the road because you can't pop up your computer, um, then that's what you're going to do. Um, and then you'll go in and you sell your stuff and go through a couple customers and go, okay, fine, but I don't need to decorate when I'm there. I don't need to, I don't need to do all that. So I personally find the whole, the most frustrating part of this whole process the development is, you know, we can account for it, and there's tools, and we found different techniques to do it. And to me, it's the user acquisition piece is still the maddening piece of the whole thing. I don't know what you guys think. So if you're thinking cross-platform, you still like you're always. You, it comes down to acquiring users and getting users there. Um, and there's a million people walking around here that have the secret sauce. All you have to do is integrate their SDK and just one line of code, and we'll have it all taken it takes care five of. Minutes. I've been working on that joke for like a week, so you got to give me a little more. Time. <laughs> well, what do, you, what do you guys think? I, I can tell you probably one of the most maddening things is the sheer number of SDKs that I have to integrate right now, yeah. and it's 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 all it's almost. I just looked at the list uh, for a, a partner game that I'm working on right now, and it's ridiculous. I, you know, I almost don't have any memory left, <laughs> you know, on the device afterwards. So, I mean, that that to me is something that, that you know that is really frustrating. And some of them are quite bloated, but they're getting better. Yeah. Um, but uh, and you know, and then we have different ones for different devices, and we also have them for different territories. So, you know, for lately for me, that's been probably one of the biggest pains because then there's always an update, like right as you got your last build and you're ready to submit, and then, oh, we got an update to the SDK. So it's just always one more thing. It's like almost like going back to the days of working with the carriers. Yeah. You know, there's yeah. always yeah. something else. Always something else, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I was thinking about it. We, I just did a game, and so you had an SDK for the publisher who's published in the game. We had an SDK for, like, uh, the TapJoy pieces of it, the, the, you know, the monetization pieces. We had the Flurry SDKs. We have, all these different pieces, you go in and they're like, oh yeah, and we just updated that one. So you're going all the way back and retesting it, making sure everything works. It's a royal pain. How about for you guys? What do yeah, you we have about 15 SDK in, in some part, maybe it's 15, yeah. Is that the most frustrating part of this? Yeah, that's, yeah that's, that, that's very frustrating because you have to update all the time and, and uh, the more SDK you add, or also the bigger the size of the, the app you have and, and you want to keep it small so that people can download over 3G. Not everyone is on Wi-Fi, and also the more instability, you know, 
you have in the game. So it, it's it's pretty uh, it's pretty difficult. Ideally, would like to do server to server, but um, um, for, I don't know why it's you know vendors don't like this. Uh, they want their SDKs uh, inside this. We're using also a mediation layer called Versely, and, and uh, there are others. Uh, we found it to also to be uh, very important to be able to fine tune uh, on the fly uh, the uh, all the SDK and the vendor SDKs. What's the most frustrating part for you, Lisa? I'm trying to get my developers to actually put in all those SDKs <laughs> um, because it, you're right. I mean, it is it's constantly changing and um, and we know that there's value there. There's value in in tracking and analytics and there's value in actual cash with the ad networks and the um, aggregators and the it you have to have them in there but it is every single time I win a, a, an argument and get them in they, there's an update and they won't they hate me Carl are you hearing anything from the developers what's the common Fix complaint it, will you? No, I, I never heard of so many problems like that. Yeah. <laughs> you need to no. fix it. Uh, well, I think with Unity, we want to really help uh, in some ways on that, like in, in two ways. One, we create the asset store uh, where people can easily put their SDK in for game developers, easily have access to it and implement it within it. Uh, of course, it builds up and there could be conflicts. And we are not, hey, this is something that we cannot really uh, fix. It. It's up to you how many SDKs you put in there. But I think at, at Unity we are changing, not changing kind of our philosophy so in some ways, is that we were a tools company and we are a tool company with deliver a tool. But now we have and we have now uh, reaching two million uh, users, so it becomes a different viewpoint that we have to look at. Are we pure a tools company or are we serving a community? And I think what the direction of Unity is, is creating more a solution for that. And I think it is definitely what we're looking at. How can we help out our community? But is the community frustrated with one particular thing? Like, out of all those people you're working with, all those millions of people? If they are frustrated with, with us, it's, <laughs> they want our GUI, <laughs> a better GUI. And, and there's several uh, uh, solutions out there, several SDKs you can call and mm. build on top of that. And I think it's frustrating because they cannot have easy access to it or better or faster. I think that's one of the frustrating things. They have, and, and we have to. We listen to our communi community, and we know what's frustrating is for them. It's very important to listen to that, and I think that's something we are addressing and make it easy for the community. We want to be a, a solution. That's what we are working on. Cool. So I was going to turn it over to questions, unless you had something else you wanted to add, Rob. Yeah, that uh, no, of, I, I, of I, I, I was going to talk about one of my Unity <laughs> frustrations, <laughs> but no. Turn off the microphone. No, 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 I'm just teasing. No, go ahead. No, 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 no I just tease it. So anybody out there have any questions for this group? Go dig in deep. All right, sir, you're up. Which SDKs are the smoothest for you with the least amount of updates and testing? Uh, the, well, that's the thing. There's so many. I mean, like, I think uh, on one of my titles right now for, for, for it's a North American release, I think there's 12, a total of 12. It's not that there's any that are difficult or others. I mean, so, you know, if they have a Unity wrapper, that obviously makes it a lot easier because we don't have as much work to do. Um, and it's it's mostly just like the size. Like, well, we're 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 fine. We're we're you know near you know we're out of beta. We're getting close to release, and then we get an updated SDK, and all of a sudden now we're at 51 megabytes or something like that. Yeah. You know, so so it's it's not there's not one that's harder or more difficult or more challenging to implement over the other. It's just simply just the logistics and the size. And our our our, our, our product managers and our acquisition people are always wanting more, and they're wanting more functionality, and they're asking, asking, asking. And it's okay if you know up front, right? But when you're doing a partnership game, when they're coming to you with the finished product, and all they want to do is just get it out the door, the next thing you know, that, that's, probably the, that's probably the biggest challenge is, is just mostly the logistics. It's not one in particular. Anybody else? So everybody talked about cross-platform as uh, mobile devices, uh, browser, Mac, PC, but uh, nobody mentioned anything about uh, going cross-platform over into the different console bar boxes and moving from uh, the Xbox platform backwards to the Mac or PC or to the mobile Good devices yeah. or even communicating between them. Has anybody had that, any experiences along those lines? So like a console connecting to a mobile device type yeah. of connecting? Well, I cannot talk about the, the connecting part, but um, there's a very interesting game uh, made uh, 
probably know it, uh, so many robots. Uh, what I liked about it, that they did the port from console to, uh, cash, uh, to iOS. And what they did, they used the full art assets. And they used that and dragged it in and it worked uh, with Unity. And that's a great success story. You see that using the same art content already works on mobile devices. Okay. But I think that uh, with building out more social APIs and, and all the support for that, I think we're going to see games that are going to communicate. But I think it's very um, important that to also understand where is console heading and what is console. Because when you look at a, a mobile device, I, uh, iOS has also announced their support for um, like hand, a, controllers. Ha hand controllers. So and with AirPlay, I think that's where we have to define what is console. Is it, is it really the, the box at home or is it me coming home and playing my device and playing on a big screen? Uh, uh, when we look at uh, the Android devices and also BlackBerry has no the, uh, support for, uh, say that again, that word? Controllers. Controllers. <laughs> <laughs> I'm here I think, for you. <laughs> <laughs> that's from yesterday because of the cloudiness. <laughs> yeah. But I think that that is where I think console is heading. It's coming home and put my mobile device there and, and play it on a big screen. And I think maybe we can plug it in in our console where we have a lot more GPU and CPU. Okay, and that's what I think where we're heading. Yeah, I thought about that too. I mean, as I use the Apple TV, and I'm like, I'm an Apple guy, I guess. But um, watching that whole transition as the Apple TV is getting more powerful and your device is getting more connected, it's, what is a console anymore? Is it the traditional console of what we saw before? If I think back to my old Atari or Odyssey back in the day, but thinking about what's the modern console look like, and does that kind of cross-platform exist in that manner? Um, instead of from like a, a CD or ROM type of drive. Yeah. Yeah. On top of that, the, the, the TVs that now have built in entire systems, I know you can notice them as well, but uh, communicating between mobile devices and TV as a platform and like actually playing a card game where everybody in your room has their own hand yeah. on the TV, you've got all those things. And Google's done the same thing, right? For, the, yeah. for their Chrome yeah. uh, works on the TV set with a small little plug-in. Uh, yeah, your Samsung will yeah. Yeah. Just well, look up automatically. Just, just, you know, the thing, I really distinctly see the experiences as two separate experiences. And, you know, when I'm designing games, when I was designing console games, I had one set of requirements, and now I have a completely different set of requirements for mobile. And I really, I really think, like, what we're talking about, that convergence of them, I really think is in the cards, and I really think that it's in the future. But right now, it's about acquiring users and monetizing those users. And in, until there's really that motivation to do so, you know, right now a lot of these things are really great toys, uh, and, but, and they're great ideas and they're eventual, eventualities of technologies, but they're not, there's not the critical mass for them right now. And I think it's gonna, there's going to need to be the killer app. You know, there's going to need to be the Angry Birds at home type of experience that's a killer app that opens people's eyes. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, uh, you mentioned earlier uh, that you try and have the same game experience across different devices, and I was wondering, um, you have to deal with uh, devices with a lot of different uh, varied capabilities, so how do you avoid, or what are some of the techniques you use to avoid having a lowest common denominator experience um, and having a, a poor uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, user experience on a higher end device? That's a good question. <laughs> I can answer from a very technical viewpoint, but uh, I think you guys have a lot more Yeah, I, mean, I think it is more of a technical question. But. Well, I mean, I, I come at it from discipline. You're, you know, it's, you know, uh, the, when you're, because when you're, you have to consider those requirements. Just like when you were making console games, that's the hardware that you got. You got to make your best with it. And, and just because, you know, you've got a high-end device that are in the market that you want to take advantage of, there, there are, you know, the beauty of video game development is, it is it's a bunch of magic and it's a bunch of prestidigitation and, you know, tricks. And, you know, y you can get really good looking content and really, really amazing experiences that run on a lower end device. Now, the approach that we take is that um, we typically, because we need to support the iPhone 4s, we need to support the, the 512 meg Android devices. But as long as we get a decent play experience in term of, terms of frame, frame rate and input sampling, if, we take it, if, we, if it's degraded visually, people know when you're playing on an iPhone 4 or a 3GS, you know you're not going to get the best graphics experience. You know that there's newer phones, right? But as long as the frame rate is there and the more important, the user input sampling and you can play, and have it, have it be just as seamless. It doesn't have to look as beautiful and have as many shadows and as many detailed materials. Do you support every device, no matter what? Like, 
Where do you cut, draw the line and say, I just don't support that anymore? Well, f for us right now, it's the 5, 12 meg Android devices and the iPhone 4. Oh, and oh, the, the biggest one is the uh, iPod V4. That's the toughest one that we have the, the toughest time with. Uh, but depending on the title, you know, uh, you know, it's it, it's typically an important platform to us. Hey, one of the things I would uh, advise you is we have a website called Unity Hardware Stats, and there you can see what uh, who is all using, uh, which devices are used. Hey, when you launch a Unity game, it sends basically a signal, and it says that device. So we can actually see how many devices are opening Unity uh, games. So that gives you a really insight, like oh, what devices support and not support. From a very technical viewpoint, in Unity, you can really say by script, if I will uh, build that game to that device, offload those textures, and make sure you load that texture. And you can also, uh, level of details, when you set for that platform, load all of them, and if I do for a lower end device, uh, uh, only those uh, three of these maybe. And then our community has built on top of that. Uh, like Alchemy Labs made a plugin called Multi-Platform Kit where you actually not just per platform, but per device can define which textures, which materials, what meshes you're going to load. So it makes it easy for you in some ways to do that. So, and of course, yeah, profile, 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 as much as possibly you can. So. Anybody else? Well, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you, everyone, panel, too. Thanks for your time. Thanks for everything. Good seeing you. Good seeing you. Yeah.